All right, here's my video on the new MindLab Xterra Pro. I ordered a few of these and they came in pretty quick. I went down and picked them up. We're gonna open this one up right now and we'll do an unboxing video for you and then we'll show you how to put it together. And we'll turn it on, go through the menus, all the settings. And I think if you just watch this video through once or twice, you will have this thing down, I promise. If you're thinking about getting one of these or you already have, this is the video for you. And I'll tell you what, if you stay tuned to the end, there's a special surprise for you at the end of this video as well. And if you're anything like me, you're gonna skip right to the end right now. That's fine, go ahead and do that, skip to the end, but make sure you come back, watch the video and hang out with me. And we'll see you guys in a bit, stay tuned. Okay, like I said in the intro of the video, we're gonna go ahead and break this into three parts. We'll unbox it real quick, then we'll assemble it, and then I'll go through the entire menu with you, teach you everything you need to know about it. It's really simple, easy to use, not intimidating at all. You'll see when we get to that part, but let's go ahead and start by showing you the box. I'll put a graphic up on the screen right now for you, showing you a picture of the front here. You can pause that and take a look at anything you wanna see there. Here's the back. Some pretty nice artwork on here. Another graph up for you of the back. You can pause that and read it if you want. And then the sides, uh, here's the front side, back side, different graphs for you to look at. And on the very end here, I'm just gonna read this to you real quick. It says designed by MindLab Electronics out of Australia and assembled for MindLab Electronics out of Australia, but made in Malaysia. So it's made in Malaysia as far as it being built, but it's assembled, the parts are put together in Australia and shipped from Australia. So, okay, there we go. Let's take a look at the box. It's not sealed as is typical with all their products lately, they are not sealed. So we'll open the box up here, see what's inside. Okay, first thing I noticed right off the bat is my dealer put a gift in here for me. Let's take a look and see what that is. This came from my dealer, so I'm not really sure um, if your dealer would do something for you like that, but this one is a, oh, it's a Mind Lab compass. <laughs> nice. It's a little uh, Mind Lab electronics compass. Very cool. Nice little touch by the dealer there. Placerville hardware out of Placerville, California. All right. Uh, let's take a look at the, uh, Owner's manual here, a little beginning starting. It's not an owner's manual, it's a starting guide. Getting started guide. And it, pocket size, when you fold it, it's made of a waterproof material, so you can put it in your pocket or a pouch or something, pull it out in the field and refer to it. It's kind of got everything you need to know here. It's a really nice guide, like I said, very heavy construction and waterproof. Some good information on here. Inside it is a little pamphlet that talks to you about safety and instructions on um, Bluetooth and things like that. The power ratings on the machine. And here is the lower shaft, which is a rough texture. You can feel the roughness of this, but it is super, super strong. I mean, I cannot even bend that in the slightest. There is no way that a person can bend that. To break it would be incredible forces. And, um, the yoke is glued in down here, and it appears to be some type of spun carbon fiber type material. No matter what it is, it's crazy light and crazy strong. So no matter what it's made from, it's built to last, absolutely. Let's see if we can get this out. So check this out, the control head is its own unit here. Let's open that real quick and take that out. Very nice. So it's got a rubberized black section here. The green part is a hard plastic. And there's a cam lock down here where it would slide on the upper shaft. Charging port here, a flashlight, waterproof headphone connection, two buttons on the left side. You can see these two buttons right up here, on off and a light. And then you have your Wi-Fi button over here. It's Lightweight, but it feels like it's built as good as the Equinox 900 is, or even, 
I wouldn't say the Manicore because it's a little more plasticky feeling up here than it is on the Manicore. The Manicore feels very metallic and metal-like up here, alloy. But there you go, that's the control head. Let's see if I can take this section off here. Or just lift it up maybe, there we go. Let's start with the arm cuff. Inside the arm cuff is a little plastic bag with a screw, I'm sorry, with a, yeah, an Allen wrench and a screw, button head screw with a thread lock on it, blue thread lock on it. And then the arm cuff itself, which is made of a, a flexible, green, hard plastic. The entire thing is one piece, one piece design. And the Velcro is already on there. When we put it together, we'll take a look at that, but I can tell you already that it's not enough Velcro for me. I can barely get my arm in here right now, just my arm. It barely fits on that. And if I had a shirt or a jacket or anything, there's no way I'd get my arm in that. Um, even with it, let's see, I could get it all the way out to just about there to grab. It makes it a little better, but it would barely get on with the jacket. So uh, it's a little small on that, but let's see what else we got here. And we have the upper shaft here. It's aluminum with cam locks. Mid shaft is aluminum as well. And you have the hole here for that screw that comes up through the bottom of the arm cuff system. Lightweight aluminum and built really strong and, and it feels it feels to be very high quality. No issues with that whatsoever. We got a charging cable here. The typical charging cable that goes into a USB. And then this is a magnet based system that jumps right onto the back of the machine back there and just sits there with the magnet. And when you're ready to pop it off, you just lift it off and it'll come right off. But it's magnet that holds it on there. So very nice. Great design on that. And then we have a coil hiding down here. Let's take a look at that. Take this piece of cardboard off. And there's your coil, V12X. And it's got the two rubber grommets in here for the yoke. They're teardrop shaped. They're pretty thick. And then one screw with no nut, it's threaded over here. The boot is really high, nice, and well built. Very impressive. I like that. Great design on that. Uh, wish that all the manufacturers did that. That's actually one of the better ones I've seen in a long time from any company. So I like the height of it and how strong it is. Cable's nice and thick. It feels like it's a good quality cable. Proprietary connection here. The skid plate is already on the coil. The coil itself feels very light. It is just lightweight in feel and in construction. It just feels like a very lightweight coil. So don't know what else to say about that. That's all there is in the box. And that kind of completes our unboxing video here. So let's go ahead and put it together and we'll uh, turn it on after that and check it out. All right, stay tuned. Okay, let's start by taking this upper shaft and mid shaft section here. And we're going to slide the control head on. We're gonna open up this part down here on the bottom. And then with this screw hole on the bottom, in other words, oriented down, we're gonna take this and slide it over this way and just kind of set it here for a second and lock it and we'll leave it here for a second. So now we have the screw hole on the bottom. Next, we will put the arm cuff section on. We'll take a look at it real quick. There is a hole on one end down here. So you gotta find that hole, that's the back. That is the back. So as I put this on here, you can see the hole goes towards the back. We'll slide it up. It will stop, it can't go too far because the plastic will stop it. We'll set it here for a second. And we'll get your button head screw out and your Allen wrench that came with it. 
and we'll screw that in. Make sure you don't cross thread this. Be very careful that, to feel that it uh, goes in nice and easy. If it starts to bind at all, it might be cross threaded. So stop and recheck it. Don't need to over tighten that. It has thread lock on it, so it should be fine. All right, so now we have the upper shaft kind of done here. Let's go ahead and loosen this cam lock. Now on this piece here, it's ambidextrous. You can put it in either way. You might have to kind of push it in a little bit. But once you get it in there, you can lock it. And then we'll take the coil. And get the wire kind of unwound here real quick. And just gently kind of pull on the cable just to straighten it a little bit, just to relax it. Just relax the cable just a little bit here. It's been wound up for several days in the box, so just kind of relax it here a little bit. Gently just kind of pull and stretch it just a little bit. All right. Now, my lab coils, this is the front where the logo is. The, the logo goes out front, so that's the toe, the front. So we're gonna put it on like this. So the first thing we're gonna do is get these two teardrop shaped rubber grommets out by unscrewing this. And we'll set that down for a second. And these go in these little recessed areas. It doesn't matter which way you put them in. Just drop them right in those little recessed areas. And they have to be kind of pushed and fitted into there so that once they're in there, you can see by a side profile that they're just barely sticking out down there. So make sure that they're recessed into that cavity. Let's do the other one real quick. Okay, both of the grommets are in place. Again, we'll make sure that the machine is upright like this and that the coil is logo out, logo to the front. It's gonna be a pretty tight fit here when you get this pressed in there. So you can turn it sideways and look down the hole here to kind of line it up. And once you get it lined up perfectly, the screw will just drop right in like that. And we'll turn it this way. Push and turn until it starts to grab. It looks like the threads are grabbing, so I'm gonna make sure you don't over tighten this for a couple reasons. One, it could break and it's just not necessary. And number two, in the field, if you ever wanna take this coil off for some reason, um, you don't wanna ever have to have it so tight that you need a tool and just can't use your hand to untighten it. It's just not necessary, so, okay. Now you can see that the coil, the, the wire, I'm sorry, has kind of a natural curve to it here, as you can see. So a lot of people, are really hung up on which way you coil this around the, the shaft here. And some people will even call you out saying you went the wrong way. Well, there is no wrong way. The, the, if you coil it one way around and then t put it in and turn it on um, and test it in every way and then undid it and coil it the other way and retested it, there'd be absolutely no difference. So aesthetically, it might look different, but you can wrap it whichever way you wanna wrap it I'm gonna to choose to wrap it this way right now for me. To know how many wraps you need to do, you'd have to open the mid out to stop. I would take it all the way out to stop. And this out to just about stop and then Take the machine and put it on the ground and feel the height that you need. From this point on, I would try to, if you're gonna to try to shorten a little bit because this machine is really long and it's perfect for tall people. But if you're not super tall, you might wanna make sure that you just start down here, loosen this cam lock and come in about three or four inches and lock it and leave all this exposed section down here. Start with that, recheck again. If the height is still too long, then you can adjust it at this adjustment here. 
So loosen that and bring it into different lengths until you get it right where you want it. When you have the machine completely perfect for your height, then go ahead and start doing your wraps again. So we're going up to this section right here. You can see that I can go one more wrap here comfortably. I'm going to turn this, but it only goes in one way because there's a detent in here. So just kind of spin this until it drops in. At some point it'll drop in here, push forward, and start to tighten the collar down. The collar will Eventually stop, then you could push forward just to make sure, push forward to make sure, and recheck it. No need to over tighten that again. And the machine is ready to go. It's assembled and ready to go. Now, ideally, you'd want to get some Velcro and put some Velcro right here and fasten this wire to this part right here so that it doesn't move down here with the piece of Velcro. And then you'd want to do the same thing up here to protect the angle of this. You, you don't want this coming down like that and pulling hard in a weird direction. You want it to be relaxed and kind of fixed to this shaft right about here. Now the problem with this stuff is, is that if you put a piece of Velcro right here, when you loosen this or put it in your car or whatever, or backpack, what's going to happen is the Velcro is going to get stuck here. So you have to loosen the Velcro a little bit. So Something to think about when you consider putting Velcro on that. It is not absolutely necessary to have Velcro up here. It's just to help maintain that angle a little bit. But it is pretty important to have the Velcro down here because this wire has metal in it. And when metal moves, it's detected by the metal detector circuit. If the metal stays perfectly still down here and it, do it doesn't move, it's not likely to be detected by the circuit. In fact, the circuit can kind of ignore it in a way. So anyway, you want to try to get something down here just to hold that wire right there if you can. I'll take a look here and see. Yeah, here we go. This is what they look like. The machine did not come with these, but you can buy these online. They're just, they're cable ties is what they're called. They're Velcro cable ties. And the way it works is you take this and you go around the cable with this, with the furry side away from the cable and the uh, other hard side of the Velcro towards you. And then you run this through this hole, pull it until it tightens up on the cable. And now this will always stay on your cable. This will stay with the cable at all times. So if you take the coil off, this just stays here. When you put it back on, then you just take this and pull tight down here. Stretch it over like that. And now that's fixed down there. And if you need to, you could kind of turn it a little bit to that side, but that's what you want right there. That's like, that's ideal setup right there. So there we go. We have it all assembled. Next thing will be turning it on and going through the menu system with you guys. But how easy was it to assemble? I mean, there was literally a couple cam locks, a thumb screw in the front and a little tiny screw in the back with an Allen wrench and very easy. Took all of about three or four minutes to do that. Without all my blabbing, I could have had it done in a couple minutes. So, all right, there we go. Let's uh, skip ahead to the next section. All right, let's start by taking a look at the buttons on here. We have the minus button, setup or cogwheel, plus button, Accept Reject button, Frequency Selection button, Pinpoint or Detect button, All Metal Mode button, and the Search Mode button. And up here in the top left corner, we have the On Off button. We have the Backlight button over here. And then the Wireless Headphone button is over here. All right, how to turn the machine on. We're gonna start up here in the top left corner on the outside edge. There's a little button here, push it in. That light comes on and the machine is on. Do the same thing to shut it off. 
Now this time we're going to do a factory reset on the machine. To reset the entire machine back to factory, hold in the power button and keep it held in until you see FP show up on the screen. Keep it held in. And there you go. First thing I'm going to do just so we can see what we're doing here is we're going to turn the sensitivity down with the minus sign. Just hit that button until you get the sensitivity all the way down. I'm indoors so I don't need all the chatter. Second thing I'm going to do just so we can see what we're doing is turn the light on. There's a button right here. I'm going to hit that button once and turn the backlight on. If you hit it again, the backlight is still on, but it's not red. It's just a low backlight. And then if you hit it, in, you can see the little indicator up here in the top showing you that the backlight's still on. If you hit it one more time, it goes back to no light. So once is red, twice is low light, and then off. We'll leave it on red for now. And if you hold this in, keep it held in, it turns on the light down on the floor that lights up your coil. The LED light on the back of the control head, you can see my hands lit up back here, shines a light right down onto the coil. And that's just by holding in this light button here. I'm going to hold it in again to shut that off. All right. All right, let's talk about the search modes now. This button right here toggles through the search modes. As you press this, you see it's moving across the bottom down there. You have Park 1, Park 2, Field 1, Field 2, Beach 1, Beach 2. Park 1, now, first of all, I should tell you that each one of these different settings changes the tunings inside the machine a little bit for different frequencies that are geared more towards certain types of finds. If you start in Park 1, the machine is kind of already set up to find coins and just general things that you would find in a park. Just kind of an all around good park machine. If you click this again, go to Park 2, it's better for fine jewelry in a park. And if we click it one more time, we go into the field one, very similar. So it's a good all around for relics and coins, uh, artifacts and things like that in the field. And you click it again, and it's better for find items, small items, small coins, small artifacts, things like that. And then you get to the beach one. Beach one is good for dry and wet sand for most of your beach detecting trips. But if you're going to be underwater, in the water, in the surf, and, and you have salt water uh, submerged around the coil, then you want to be in beach two. Those are all ideal settings for those types of environments. All right. And you hit it again and we go right back to the beginning. If you make some changes to one of your search profiles, let's say you go into field one and you made some changes to the machine, but you want to go back to factory reset on field one only. So you just want to reset that particular mode. While you're on it, you can hold this button in right here, the search mode selection button, hold it in and it'll reset just that mode. Hold it in. and it gave you a reset just on that mode, on field one. So now field one is factory reset. To change the frequency, you can see we're in 10 kilohertz right now, right here in the center. We're gonna go down here to the frequency button and select the different frequencies, 15, five, and 10. So that's how you change the frequency right here. All right, let's take a look at the setup menu now. When you click the setup button or cogwheel, a little icon will drop down on the bottom down here somewhere. Right now it's in the bottom left hand corner and as you click it, it'll keep going from left to right through all the different icons down there. Those are all part of your setup menu. Let's start on the bottom left hand corner here. The first one here is noise cancel. Then we have ground balance. We'll talk more about both of those in a bit. Volume, threshold, target tones, accept, reject, recovery speed. All right, some of these have submenus as well. If we go over to volume, for example, which is right here, and we hold the cogwheel in this time, hold it in, keep it held in, a line appears underneath that gets you to a second menu. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but that's an advanced menu for volume. You can hold it in again to get back out of there and go to the regular volume. 
For example, while we're in volume, I could turn it down right now. I could hold the button and it goes down quickly to zero. Or I can toggle through and step up or hold it. And it goes all the way back up to 25 on volume. Again, I can click the cogwheel, go to the next thing to threshold. We could turn threshold up. And you can hear the threshold coming in now. And again, if we hold this down on this particular one, watch what happens. If I hold it down, there is no submenu. It gave, an, it gave you a noise, but there's no special submenu on that one. Let's go to the next one. See if there's one here, target tones. Let's hold it in. No. So this telling you that there is no special submenu on those ones. However, on the next one over here for accept reject, there is an advanced menu. We'll hold that in. And you can see the line up here. We'll talk more about this in a bit. I'm going to turn that off for now. And then we'll head back over to recovery speed and back to the regular detect screen. Again, you can always get back to the detect screen just by clicking this button down here on the bottom. It's either going to be pinpoint or detect. All right, now we're going to talk about how to turn the vibrating handle on and off. Vibrating handle is a very powerful feature to have because not only are we listening to the tones through the headphones or the speaker, but we're also seeing numbers appear on the screen telling us the visual ID number and we're seeing those with our eyes. So we have our ears listening, our eyes looking, and now our hand can feel, we can feel the vibrations and get a little bit more sense about what the machine is telling us. Every time the machine makes a sound, it's gonna vibrate as well. And it just gives you a really good look into the ground at what the machine's trying to tell you. All right. Let's go to the cog wheel, the setup wheel here. We're gonna work our way over to that icon right there, which is volume. Once you're on that icon, if you hit the frequency button down here in the bottom right, it turns the vibrating handle on. You get a little vibration in the handle telling you it's on. And you see up here in the top right corner of the screen, there's a little icon right there showing you that there's a little vibration symbol on the screen telling you that the handle's on. And to shut it off, it's the same thing. Just hit that same button and it's off. And then we could go to detect. We're going to turn the vibrating handle back on for a second so we could show you the next part. So as we toggle over to this one, we tap the frequency and there's our icon. Now that it's turned on and only when it's on, can you do this? If you hold in the setup, cogwheel button, just hold it in until we get to the advanced menu down here. Now you can click this again down here and it turns it back on and it turns on the ferrous vibration. So it'll vibrate on iron. This way you can feel iron. Not only can you hear iron, but you can feel iron with your hand. Another very powerful feature. So again, to shut that off, just click this button down here and it's off. And I want to say one more time that you can't even turn it on to begin with if it's not on on the front screen out here. So when you're in this icon and there's no line underneath it, you're not in the advanced menu, you got to make sure it's on up here first before you can even turn it on for iron. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about sensitivity and why it is so important on this machine. It's important on any metal detector, but especially this one, you want to run your sensitivity up as high as you can. And it goes all the way up to 25 from this detect screen right now. You can click the negative sign or the plus sign to toggle through. If I go down a step at a time, you can see it going down if I go up. Or if I hold this button in, it'll go up quickly all the way to 25. I'm going to bring it all the way back down because I'm indoors and it's going to make a lot of noise in here if I don't. But you want to run it at 23 to start with, I recommend. And when you turn it on and you're in a park or you're in the field or you're at a beach, swing it around a little bit and see how it sounds. If it's nice and stable, maybe you could sneak it up to 24 or even 25 to try to get the most depth out of the machine that you can. Depth is super important at a park where you're trying to hear those really deep coins, those silver coins, or in a plowed field where you have a big difference in height between the lows and the highs on the plow, or at a beach where everything in the sand can be really deep. So you wanna run it as high as you can and we'll start at 23. If it's starting to make a lot of noise, it's chatter and you hear a lot of beeps and it sounds like it's interference. What we could do first is a 
noise cancel, an auto noise cancel. So click your setup cog wheel to get to the first icon down here in the bottom left. And from here, you can click the negative sign, the plus sign, or this sign to start a noise cancel. Any of these three will do it. We're gonna click this one to start an auto noise cancel. The machine listened to several different frequencies from negative nine all the way up to plus nine, and it chose a frequency that it felt was the least amount of interference. So you can repeat this process, you can do it as many times as you want, and when the machine finally settles down, the next thing you wanna try is a ground balance. And what that does is it's looking at the mineralization in the ground, the amount of iron, for example, or other minerals in the ground that could be interfering with the machine causing all that noise. We'll go to the setup cogwheel and go to the next one over. And to do a ground balance, you would hold this button in and pump the coil up and down. We'll do that in the next video where we take it out in the field. But for now, refer to your owner's manual to see how to do that procedure because I can't do it indoors for you, but what you would do is an auto noise cancel and then a ground balance, and then come back and revisit your sensitivity. And how's it doing? Is it settled down? Can we get it up to 24 or 25? Try to get it up as high as you can, but in other words, don't turn the sensitivity down just because it's making chatter without first having tried a noise cancel and a ground balance. Okay, just a little bit about ground balance. We can't really do a real effective ground balance indoors, but I will tell you how the procedure is done in the field and we will in the next video cover this in depth. For now, I'm just gonna tell you that if you click the cog wheel or setup button here till you get to the second icon and you'll see that your ground balance icon right there. To initiate the ground balance, you would press and hold this button over here, the accept reject button. And when you do, you'll see a little icon start flashing up here showing you the auto ground tracking icon flickering on and off, and you'll pump the coil up and down while you're holding this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that indoors real quick to show you what that looks like. Hold the button in, pump the coil, look up on the top of the screen. You see the little icon blinking up there? That is your auto tracking icon, and it's just blinking right now to show you that you're doing a ground balance. The machine likes a ground balance of zero indoors, I'm gonna let go. From here I would just hit the detect button and start detecting, and it's ground balanced. However, you can also go back into ground balance. And from here, after you have your ground balance complete, and like here, like the zero, what I could do now is just tap this button one more time, just tap it, and you can see auto tracking is now on up here in the top of the screen right there. The auto tracking icon is lit, and it's showing you that right now it's in auto tracking mode. So when I go back to the detect screen, you can see it's actively listening to and adjusting itself for ground balance. Once you've done your noise cancel and your ground balance, your sensitivity should be adjusted and you should be off and running, ready to detect. All right, we're gonna adjust the volume real quick. For volume, you just click the setup or cog wheel until you see that icon right there. Once you're on there, you can turn the volume up or down. Again, you can hold these to quickly change. I'll leave it at 20 for now. And once you're done with that, you can click the detect button and the volume is set. Okay, so there is an advanced volume setting as well. When you're in the volume, if you hold this button in, the cog wheel or setup button, hold it in, you'll see a little line appear on the bottom down there showing you that you're in the advanced menu. When you're in here, what you're setting now is the volume for the ferrous region. The ferrous region means, ferrous means iron, and that's the region of Detection up here in the top, you'll see that little graph that goes all the way across. It's only flashing down here. It's the volume for that little section down there, which is where your nails, your staples, your tacks, and all your little bits of iron typically come in. You don't want to hear your nails loud like you do your coins. You do want to know that there's nails there, so you absolutely do want to hear something there. But I'd recommend that you start with a low number like five. So a volume of five for the iron and if we hold this in and go back to the regular volume, we have a volume of 25 for the coins. Once again, we can go into the advanced menu. We have a volume of five for the ferrous region and 25 for coins and all other volume. I, would, I do wanna tell you also that this is a setting that affects the entire machine, no matter what mode you're in down here. This is a global setting, the volume setting.
When you're all done, hit the detect button and ready to go. All right, one thing I wanted to tell you about as far as doing auto noise cancel and ground balance, when you do this and you're trying to optimize the machine to get it as high as you can on sensitivity, it is only affecting the search mode you're in right now. So we're in field one. So you just did an auto noise cancel and a ground balance only for field one. That means that if you go to field two or change to a different search mode, you're gonna to have to repeat these steps because this is saved only to the program that you're on right now. So auto noise cancel, ground balance, affect only the program you're on currently. If you switch programs, you gotta do this again. And I recommend that you do it every time you switch programs or frequencies, especially frequencies. If you're in this mode right here and you decide you wanna try a different frequency, as soon as you click this button, you have to go back and do another fresh auto noise cancel and a ground balance. That's important. All right, I'm gonna talk about a really cool feature on the machine called Target Tones. To access it, we'll hit the setup cogwheel until we get over to that little icon right there. So you go over to the right, you see that icon? It's got those little musical symbols on the right edge. And you can see right now there's a setting on the screen of two. So you, there's a setting of one, two, five, AT, which stands for all tones, and DP, which stands for depth. So let's go back to one real quick. Real quick example of what's going on here is, one just means that you're using one tone for everything that you detect. So a small piece of gold is gonna sound exactly like a large silver dollar. There'll be no tonal differences between any targets whatsoever. They all have the same one tone. Two means that you can have two different tones. You could have a tone break where anything below that sounds like one certain tone. Anything above that has a whole different tone that you can set. And this one, you could have up to five different sections of tones. So you can set it up on this one so that a silver half dollar does sound different than a US nickel, for example. And then you have all tones, which goes from 99 on the high end all the way down to a negative number on the bottom and it gives you a variant on every different signal where you can actually hear the differences between for example a penny and a dime or a dime and a quarter or a quarter and a half you can hear the differences it'll give you different numbers and every different number has a different tone so the bigger the heavier the silver coin or the bigger the, the coin typically the higher the tone and then a nickel, for example, makes a pretty low tone, and so does gold jewelry and gold coins. So AT, or all tones, is what I like to use. That's on all my machines, I try to run it in all tones. Then there's another really cool feature on here called depth, which generally speaking takes anything that's deep and makes it quiet in volume. So something, for example, that is big or shallow is gonna sound really loud something that is small or deep is gonna sound really quiet. So for example, if you're swinging in a park and there's a bunch of quarters in the ground and a lot of those quarters are at two inches, they're gonna sound one way. They're gonna have a certain volume and a certain tone. But if you swing over a really deep eight inch quarter or let's say 10 inch quarter, it's way down there. It's still gonna have that high tone, but it's gonna be really quiet. So with this setting, you can hear depth which is really cool because if you're tired of digging clad quarters that are right on top and you're really trying to listen for those deep silver quarters, this is the setting you wanna be in so you can hear depth. So again, it's one tone, two tones, five tones, all tones and depth. Okay, I wanna to talk to you about threshold now. So threshold is that tone you hear right now, that steady tone you hear from the machine. And we could turn that up or down right now in volume by toggling over to that icon with the setup button. You can see the middle icon right there. And right now the volume is 13. If I hold it down, it'll get really loud. And we'll go down. You know, I recommend if you're gonna run headphones with this, try about a setting of eight or so. You wanna hear this just kind of in the background. If you're running the speaker and you don't have headphones on, Somewhere between 12 to 15 is where you want to be. But you want to hear that sound. That way it lets you know that the machine's on and it's detecting. And if you're out, like, say for example, in a field, in a plowed field or 
in a old home site where you think people might have been living and you're swinging the machine around and it's not making any noise, it's not hearing any targets at all, and this threshold is steady, you may not be in the area where people were at because if there was a home there or you're in an area where there's an old battlefield, for example, let's say, or something, and there should be some iron in the ground, some nails, things that people could have lost a long time ago. Well, you want to be able to hear the threshold break. When the threshold goes away, it's telling you that it the machine went right over a piece of iron or something that was discriminated out. So it depends on where you have your accept reject set up and what you're discriminating, but anything that the machine is discriminating out will cause a blank in that threshold tone. So it's a powerful feature to let you know that you're in the right area. So if you're breaking threshold a lot, it lets you know that you're over some iron, over some nails, and you're bound to find something good hiding in all that stuff. So threshold's very important. And you just turn the volume up and down right here with this, the minus and plus. Like I said, eight with headphones to start maybe in 12 to 15 with speaker and see if you like those but it's good to have your threshold on get used to using it it's a very powerful feature so when you're all done hit your detect button and off you go okay in this section i'm going to talk about accept and reject but before i do that i want to go back to what we just talked about and in this section right here where you select your target tones you want to do this first before you go into the next section on accept, reject, and change anything. It's important because, for example, if you had it on two and you went in and set up two and got it all done, but you really wanted to be in five or all tones, then what you just did in two was a complete waste of your time. So get in here first and select how many tones you want to be in. Again, I recommend all tones to you or depth for the advanced user where you can really hear that difference in depth. But for the example here today, I'm going to leave it on five so I can show you how to do the five different sections and you'll understand the concepts involved here. So once you have this set up on five, we'll go ahead and toggle over to accept reject. And right now, what you can see happening is there's a little blinking icon up on the screen up here. You see up there right in the top left corner, right there, there's a little blinking icon, like right there. And then there's an open section here open section here and everything else is black. Well that's the section on the right there where it's all black is saying that it, it will let anything that comes in that area be heard by the machine. Anything that's blanked out down here is being discriminated and you will not hear if you swing over any of these items. So anything that gave a VDI number of negative 16 is not going to be heard. And for example if you swung over a US nickel I'm going to use the plus sign to jump all the way up to 24 here. Let's say, for example, the nickel comes in at 24, and you swing over it, and you're, you don't want to hear any more U.S. nickels. What you could do is, while you're on 24 right now, you could click the little check mark down here, the accept reject button. When you do that, it made it open right here. So that means that if you swing that same nickel over the machine right now that was a 24 a minute ago, the machine will not give you a, an audible sound and it will blank it out. It will discriminate out a 24 right now. And you could say, I want anything from 20 all the way up to 28, all discriminated out. So now, right now, anything that this machine goes over with a 20 to 28 is not going to be heard. You could put them back in by just reversing the process. But you can see how powerful this would be. Let's say you just want to find quarters today only. Then you could go up to, let's say 72, and you would take 72 and take it out, and you'd work your way all the way down. And this is a pretty drastic example, but As I work all the way down, now the machine will only hear 72 or actually 74 or above. Let me get up there so you can see. So if you took this out in the field right now and started swinging it over a park or a school, you would only hear quarters, half dollars or anything like big silver, heavy silver rings. 
You'd be missing out on all the gold, possibly dimes, pennies, nickels, and everything else. You'd miss, you wouldn't hear any of that. You'd only hear quarters, half dollars, silver dollars, big silver, and high conductors. That's all you'd hear. And that's the way that you can set the machine up to do whatever you want to do with it. And that's how accept reject works. All right, to reset this, to get all this back to the roll up here, I'm going to show you a little trick. We're going to go back and revisit something I already showed you earlier, but we're going to do it again. We're in the detecting mode of field one. Let's hold in the selection button down here for the programs. Hold it in and we'll reset field one back to factory reset. Keep it held in. Watch that top bar up there. And there we go. We're all back to normal again up on top. Just did a little reset. All right, back to the accept reject and we're gonna go into the advanced menu real quick. From here, we'll hold in this button and watch this little line will appear right on the bottom here. There's the line telling us that we're in the advanced menu. And all this does is it allows you to set how much of this iron down here you want to hear. So if you turn it all the way down to negative 16, right now you see your five different tone sections up here. You're going to hear all these tones, including all this iron down here. As you bring this up back up to zero, for example, it's going to discriminate everything from zero to negative 16 in that low ferrous range out. So you won't be hearing tacks, staples, and little bits of iron and small nails and stuff because it's all being discriminated out. And then you, when you're done with that, just go ahead and hit the button down here to start detecting. All right, this last feature is a very powerful feature you don't usually see on detectors in this budget range. I mean, this is something that you see on your $1,000 plus machines typically. And it's a very powerful feature called recovery speed. And we're going to go to the last icon down here. When you see that, you can see there's a setting of one, two, or three. And that's low recovery speed, medium recovery speed, and high recovery speed. And basically, you're going to want to get the owner's manual out and read this one page. Just read this one page. You have to because there's so much information in there that I can't talk about here in this short video. But I'll just give you a little synopsis of what's going on. If you have a quarter on the ground, and let's say it's a silver US quarter, four inches away, you have a nail. So the machine, when you swing over those two items together, the machine is going to discriminate out the nail. Now it may also discriminate out the quarter because it's so close to the nail. So with the setting of one, the machine is being told that your priority right now is depth. You want powerful depth. You want to go way down in the ground. And by doing that, it puts out a pretty big signal, pretty wide signal and it's likely to hear the nail more than it hears the quarter. Therefore, it'll blank out the quarter because it's blanking out the nail. So with a low recovery speed, that's what you get. You get good depth, but you don't get to hear the quarter right next to the nail. As you go this way, it starts to go a little bit towards the other direction where you don't get as much depth and you start to hear better separation. When you get to three, you have absolute separation. It's a high priority. The processor inside this machine is now being prioritize to hear the quarter separate from the nail. But by doing this, by setting it at three, you're also telling the machine that you know you're losing depth because you're giving up depth for the, the processor to have a higher priority in hearing the quarter right next to the nail. So you get better target separation with a high recovery speed of three. Again, open up the owner's manual and read that page. It's a very powerful section um, of the owner's manual to understand. I would recommend you read it a couple times till you get a good grip on it because it's something you want to know. And when you're in a field and you're in a lot of iron, you want to be up on these high settings of two and three. But when you're out wandering and there's no iron around, you're going to want to be at a one so you get your depth. So you got to know what you're doing and be able to change as you go, change these settings as you go. And when you read the page in the owner's manual on recovery speed, make sure you pay attention to the swing rate. It talks in there about how fast you swing the machine. And there's some information in there that when you're in these settings right here, you're going to want to understand how your swing rate can affect these settings. So make sure you read that. Pretty important. All right, let's move on. Okay, I want to talk to you about the screen now a little bit. What we're going to do is I'm going to set the machine up a certain way here so that we can see more information coming through on the screen. I'm going to start by turning the volume down. I want to put it all the way down to like three because I don't want too much chatter going on here. I'm going to turn sensitivity up over here, all the way up. I'm doing that so that the EMI here in my house will show you some numbers on the screen so we could see some more information. 
We're going to hold in the light button over here, hold it in. Turn on the LED light down there that goes down the, onto the coil. We're going to go into volume and hit the frequency button down here. Turn on the vibrating handle. And we're even going to go over here to the top right corner and click the little button for headphones. So now, from the detect screen, you can see there's quite a bit of information up there. Let's start with the top left corner. You can see that the battery indicator is showing you that I have only one bar of battery left. And I need to put it on the charger because we're almost out of battery. And also in the top left hand corner up here off the screen, but in the control unit, you'll see there's a little green light right there. That section has a red light that flashes when you have it on the charger. When the machine is fully charged, it'll turn green. So you know that it's fully charged. You can see going across the top here, you got your backlight indicator on, your LED flashlight or torch going down onto the coil, the vibrating handles on, headphones are trying to connect. You can see this bar across here. This is your discrimination showing you what discrimination pattern you're running. And then over here on the left, you have your sensitivity bar, max sensitivity right now. And the frequency is set to 10 kilohertz. We're in field one mode. And you can see the depth gauge is going all over the place. And so is the visual ID numbers. And that's just because of the EMI coming in. But the depth gauge, generally speaking, every one of those little triangles is about two inches. It does matter on the size of the target. So something really small, like let's say you had a very small solid sterling silver earring bead and um, it was reading a good high number of like let's say 60 and it's showing a depth of six inches there's a really good chance that that little small silver round earring is only going to be about two inches down but it's showing six so depending on how small it is compared to how the conductivity is this reading is not exactly precise but you'll get to know with your machine that um, Sometimes something really small can sound a little bit deeper than it really is. So that's just the, an issue with all metal detectors. Anyway, that kind of shows you everything on the screen right now. Let's go ahead and move on to the next section. Talk real brief about pinpoint just to show you where the button's at. Again, it's this button down here. And you can toggle pinpoint on and off just by touching it once. You can see that the little crosshairs come in. And we'll just demonstrate this a lot more in the field in my next video where we take it out and swing it a little bit. But for right now, I just want to show you how to turn it on and off. If you want for right now, you can read the owner's manual. But notice also that these two little bars up here are blinking on the edges. And when you pinpoint, you'll see some visualizations happen up here as this bar comes this way to complete. And that helps you know when you're right over the signal. But again, we won't be covering that right now. I'm not going to do it indoors, but we will cover it later. And you can check the owner's manual for now. But that's how you turn pinpoint on. And to get out, just hit one more time and it goes back to detect. Okay, to put the machine in all metal mode, you just click the horseshoe down here and you watch up here, you'll see your discrimination pattern will change. As soon as you click that, there is no discrimination. It's an all metal mode. It'll hear all metal right now. To go back to your preset discrimination pattern, click it one more time and it's off. I kind of talked about this a little while ago, but right here is a little light that will turn green and flash when it's being charged. When it's steady green, it's fully charged. And I tell you, I just can't wipe the smile off my face. This thing is absolutely amazing. I'm very pleased with this. At this price point, the build quality and the performance of this is just value off the charts. Like I said earlier, this would be good for a child, I would say eight years and up maybe. It's only two pounds. The fact that you can adjust this for any arm length really helps for kids. Of course, a teenager would love it. They're gonna do very well with it. They're gonna find treasure and stay interested in the hobby and it will get used. Hey, maybe buy a couple of these for the family. If you wanna take them on vacation, you know, you take the motor home out or something or you go to the desert, to a beach, you could take a couple of these and share them as a family and have fun with them find all kinds of cool things. Maybe you're a truck driver and you wanna have one of these in your truck because when you have a layover or you're at a truck stop and you wanna get out and move your legs a little bit and swing your metal detector, there's so many scenarios. Uh, 
you know, I would say contractors, construction, anybody who needs a metal detector, this is probably something that would work very well for you and last. It's completely waterproof, by the way, as well. I'll tell you what, I bought three of these brand new. I just built this one for the video. I'm gonna keep this one for my collection here. I'll do videos with it and, you know, a live dig and some stuff like that. But I have two other ones. I'm gonna give one away to somebody else and I'm gonna give one away right now on this channel in this video. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to enter the contest and I'm gonna use some software online that looks at your subscribers. And if you're a subscriber and you leave a comment, it will choose randomly one comment out from a subscriber to be a winner. So you have to be a subscriber to be entered into the contest. Now you can leave a comment either way. If you don't wanna subscribe and you wanna leave a comment, that's fine. It's just that the algorithm for the software that I'm using to pick the winner won't consider you for the contest for the free machine. But if you wanna subscribe and leave a comment down below, you will be automatically entered. On April 15th, I will do a YouTube live with the brand new box sitting up here on the counter. We'll go on the computer, we'll run the software and it will randomly choose one of you. I'll try to contact you, get your information and mail it out to you, free shipping, free machine. So having said that, if you know somebody that might wanna buy one of these as a gift for somebody or someone, a family member that you think should know about this, share the video with them and maybe they could learn about it. And if they see the video before the 15th of April, they might even win it. So anyway, there you go. That's all I have to say about this. Again, I highly recommend it to you. I will get out later this week and do some live digs with this and get another video up right away for you. And until then, um, this is the video that YouTube thinks you should watch next right here. Check that out and I'll catch you guys real soon. Take care.